everyone. We're going to start recording the session around now too. So, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for the first day of Black and Bioanth Week. We have a number of exciting talks and social media-based campaigns coming up this week. So please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Black and Bioanth for more information. Before we get to tonight's keynote presentation, I'd like to bring your attention to two additional events that we'll be hosting this week. The first is the Black Pathways in BioEnth panel, which will be taking place virtually on Thursday, February 4th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. Then on Friday, February 5th at 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll be hosting a casual networking event with the Black Science Coalition and Institute and the Society of Black Archaeologists. You'll need to register for both of these events ahead of time, so please check our social media channels for those registration links. And both events are open to all. For today's keynote, I ask that you put your questions in the chat slash questions box. We'll have time at the end of the lecture for a short question and answer session, so please add your questions to the chat during the lecture. If someone has already um, asked a question that you're interested in, you can upvote it and that'll bump it up in the queue. And so I think that's it for uh, the housekeeping. So now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, Dr. Stephanie Poindexter. Dr. Poindexter received her master's in primate conservation and her PhD in anthropology and geography from Oxford Brookes University in the United Kingdom. From there, she was hired as a postdoctoral research associate in sensory morphology and genomic anthropology at Boston University. Last year, Dr. Poindexter joined the faculty at the University of Buffalo in her current role as an assistant professor in anthropology. She currently seeks to understand how primates interact with their environment, conspecifics, and other organisms. She's also interested in how different adaptive traits evolved and their effect on a primate's behavioral ecology. She studies these questions in the adorable but endangered nocturnal primate, the slow loris, and I'm looking forward to learning more about Dr. Poindexter's research and her academic journey. I'm sure you all are too, so let's get to it. Uh, please join me for a round of virtual applause for Dr. Stephanie Poindexter. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that introduction. Um, I also really want to say thank you for the invitation to speak and to help kick off this really exciting week. Um, as Megan said, I'm going to talk uh, about my journey in academia, um, as well as like a bit of my research sort of interwoven throughout that story. Um, so I've entitled the talk From Chicago to Buffalo and All the Primates in Between, because I am a very proud Chicagoan. Um, and that's more or less, I think, where the journey really did start. And so just to know what you're getting yourself into, I'm gonna talk for about 20 minutes, and then I'm gonna leave loads of time for questions because um, I don't know, Loris is a really cool and, you know, I just I like interacting with everyone. So um, be sure to put your questions in the chat, as Megan said, and I'll get started. Let's see. Okay. So I have to admit that this is a very like cheesy sort of cliche photo, um, but it cannot be, I can't have a presentation without this being a part of my origin story. So like I said, I'm from Chicago, and this is a photo of me taken um, at the Brookfield Zoo. So um, I spent a lot of time at the Brookfield Zoo, mostly because of my dad, who really enjoyed uh, watching animals. Um, he is not any sort of zoologist or an academic. He's just a guy who enjoyed watching primates and thought they were really cool. Um, and from his enthusiasm, it kind of trickled down to me. Um, I can remember being in the primate house after, I don't know, any time that we were out of school or any holiday, we were in some primate house at some zoo at some place. Um, and he's always pointing out these really interesting behaviors or how much primates reminded him of us. And so I really have to thank him and his interests um, in ethology that kind of transferred over to me. And now I didn't always know that I'd be a primatologist or that I'd be an anthropologist for that fact. Um, but all of that more or less started when I went to undergraduate in St. Louis. So I was always really interested in, you know, thinking about different questions, finding solutions, or just figuring out what was going on in different scenarios. Um, but at the time, 
I was really, I thought that I'd be a medical doctor. And I find that this is a kind of common story that happens with a lot of academics um, in different fields where they're interested in research, that being a medical doctor is something that's familiar and, and seems like the best path to, you know, chasing those interests more or less. And so I went to WashU because it had a really good medical school and I was convinced that if I went to the undergrad of the place that had a really good medical school, um, I, I would just like get shuffled in. That's not how it works, but I'm very happy that I was under that false pretense at the time because WashU actually had a really um, diverse anthropology department. They had a lot of primatologists. And after I took my first human evolution class, um, I essentially left the lecture hall and went and dropped all of my pre-med classes because there was a whole section dedicated to how we can learn about human evolution by studying primates. So instead of going to WashU to take all of my pre-med prereqs and, and some anthropology classes for kicks, I ended up taking almost everything they offered about primate conservation. Um, so lots of courses in primate cognition, biology, behavior, social systems. Um, and I also got the opportunity to do some research at the St. Louis Zoo uh, on a chimpanzee named Holly. But one thing I'm very thankful for about that time spent at WashU um, is that they had a really strong emphasis on gaining research experience. Um, and with this always in the back of my mind, the idea of being an academic um, really kind of, it started to sit in. Um, and after doing some work with the St. Louis Zoo, I actually became a behavioral research intern. Well, I wrote this really long application about how I wanted to study all the primates they had there. Um, and I wanted to ask these questions and do this data collection. Um, what they offered me was studying ungulates and Channel Island foxes, which at the time, didn't seem very exciting, but it turned out to be a really great experience. Um, while they were not primates, I learned a lot about the behavioral methods that I still use today. And so, I don't know, I think it's important to consider all sorts of opportunities and what you can take away from them and how it might not be what you expect, but it's definitely gonna help build towards what you want to do. Um, and so once I finished at WashU, I, as Megan said, went to the UK. Um, at the time, there weren't very many programs that were focused in primate conservation specifically. Um, and so I learned about Oxford Brookes University. I was really excited about the idea of going to study in the UK. I think I'm always like itching for the next adventure, you know, wanting to travel more, wanting to see more, wanting to interact with different people. And so when I got to Brooks, um, it was a really great time. It was such a great time that I didn't leave after, after my course was over. Um, but while I was there, I got a lot of experience doing hands-on things that you would do if you were working um, in a rescue center. Um, we had an in-house journal, and so we learned, you know, kind of the behind the scenes editor editorial portions of, of, you know, putting a journal together. There's a really great museum in Oxford you may, you may know of, and we got a chance to, you know, take classes there intern there if you're interested. And I also learned what perseverance and determination felt like um, as I had a few all-nighters, especially right before I finished my master's thesis. And so this is me um, after handing in my thesis in like the primate lab where we all sort of congregated to work together and, and stay up for days on end to finish this. In retrospect, not very long document, but it felt like it would never end at the time. But I think the most important thing that happened while I was um, in the UK and at Brooks was that I met Professor Anna Nakaris and the Slow Lores. So this is a, a photo from the Little Fireface project of a juvenile Slow Lores. Um, they are this really impressive, somewhat majestic primate, if you will. Um, they've got these large eyes, round faces, really distinct markings. Um, and this is a juvenile because it still has a bit of fluffiness to, to its pelage. And as it gets older, it's gonna become a bit more sleek. Um, this, these red hues are gonna become more prominent. Um, but I definitely went into the program interested in welfare, interested in conservation. Um, I thought I wanted to study great apes, but then I learned about the slow lores and how relative to most other primates, um, we just didn't know as much about them. And so that interested me, the fact they were nocturnal interested me. There's just a whole list of things I could go on and on about that make Slow Loris is really cool. Um, so definitely follow 
um, Professor Anna Nakaris and the Little Fireface Project. If you want to learn more about slow lorises, they're always doing really great things. Um, and this is one of the sites in which I collected some of my PhD data. So meeting Anna set me off on the trajectory that led me to Southeast Asia. So I love Southeast Asia. Um, to this day, if people ask me what my favorite city is, it is Hanoi in Vietnam. Um, and I would not have visited any of these places um, if it had not been um, for doing the program at Oxford Brooks. And so the first um, place that I went for my master's thesis to collect data was in Thailand. Um, it was at a rescue center where I was working with Bengal slow lorises as well as pygmy slow lorises. I know this star is here in Vietnam, but I was working with both of them in Thailand at the time. And when I came back um, and decided to stay on to do my PhD, I um, ended up working with pygmy slow lorises in Vietnam, um, as well as the Javan slow loris in Java, Indonesia. And so how do we study slow lorises as nocturnal primates? Um, we go out at night. And this work actually really suits me. Um, at the LFP field site, typically there are two shifts. And so you'll set out around six or half five to go and find the sleeping site for the slow lorises. Um, and then by midnight, another team will come and swap over and they will stay with the same individual until 6 a.m. Because lorises are, are active between six and six. Um, and I am partial to the midnight to 6 a.m. shift. Um, the forest gets really quiet. It gets infinitely cooler than during the day. Um, I'm really, I don't know how people study primates during the day. It is just way too hot. Um, but it, it's also, there's just like this calm that comes over the forest. And so the first time I got to see slow lorises um, within their range countries, um, they were still nocturnal. So the first experience was at a rescue center, but unlike zoos here or where we keep slow lorises here, um, they um, are not under, they are not under reversed lighting. And so I was still staying up all night to do observations and sleeping for portions of the day. Um, and that, I don't know, I kind of got hooked to that system and, and into that, that way of collecting observations. So I'm not great at diurnal observations, um, but nocturnal observations are really cool. And for the Solorises, we wear um, head torches that have a red filter. Um, so they're monochromats. And so we don't wanna completely disrupt them by shining really bright white lights at them. And so the red light is um, not going to affect them as intensely as a bright white light would. Um, and so we're kind of walking around in this red hued environment following along with trackers. Each loris has um, a radio tag and it emits a unique frequency. And so we're using receivers and antennas to find a certain individual. And then we're tracking um, that frequency until we make, observa we make direct contact um, and then continue on with observations. And so over the course of, of my PhD, I would say that most of my work can be framed around the idea of studying spatial dynamics and movement. Um, and I looked at it from a physical, social, cognitive, um, and a conservation perspective. So what I've done here is made a few little slides to kind of give you a snippet of each of these. The sensory part fits in very well, but it didn't come until later, but I'll get to it, I promise. The physical. So one thing that I really appreciate about slow lorises is how agile they are. They um, engage in a whole range of locomotor behaviors, postures, um, especially this one, which I find really fascinating, which we call vertical suspension four. So we have four limbs on, um, on a substrate or particularly on the trunk when they're feeding for exudates. So lorises don't have claws, they don't have um, suction cups or they don't have any sort of adhesive that I know of that they're using to you know, hold these postures against these large branches or these large trunks. Um, and so it really is just them exerting enough force to you know, thwart gravity. And so one thing that I looked at was, you know, how are they doing this? I considered the fact that younger individuals are at smaller branches relative to adults. That wasn't true. I thought maybe that younger individuals were using different types of postures that were less difficult relative to adults. That was also not true. What turns out to be happening is that um, slow lorises, young slow lorises have relatively longer um, lower legs, hand spans and foot spans 
relative to adults. And so you can imagine them to be a little gangly, if, if you will. But they're using this to help um, access this relatively difficult posture because gums are a large proportion of their diet. And so it's a really important resource for them to exploit. Um, and so I think this is really interesting that uh, you have these young individuals who weigh different amounts, range between the mean in adults about 900, the means in, in these juveniles about 600, but their limbs um, are comparable and to the fact that you couldn't tell the difference between the two. And from a social perspective, um, I wanted to know where they were placed within their home range. And so here you can see in blue, uh, juveniles within pairs, and the dotted lines are females. So you find that the juvenile home range is typically encompassed by the female's home range, which is then going to be encompassed by the male home range. And so you find in Solaris is that they're in a uni-male, uni-female pair. So there's one male, one female, and their offspring. And they're gonna maintain um, aspects of social cohesion. They might share sleeping sites, but they're gonna interact, interact with each other socially um, unless something happens to one of the pair and then they will um, find a new pair. But you do find these um, sort of dispersed family units within slow lorises. Um, I should note here that each line is about 100 meters. Um, but we thought this was really interesting, especially for a primate that if you're reading most of the historical documents um, should be solitary. They don't interact much with other individuals. But here we're seeing um, you know, that they overlap spatially and that there is a, a pretty, you know, a relatively high degree of temporal overlap as well. And then I also looked at questions about cognition, or more specifically spatial cognition. Um, so looking at the routes that adult Solorises traveled. Um, at the Little Fireface field site over the course of a year, I did a few things to try to figure out what sort of mental representation individuals might have of their environment, how are they getting to resources that are necessary, especially knowing how important these immobile gum producing trees are. So the first thing I did was calculate the overlap of routes. Um, so that is what percentage of the routes traveled on different nights um, could be categorized as the same pathway. So the, they were within five meters of each other to account for the GPS error, and they um, were more or less perpendicular to each other for about, or they were parallel to each other, excuse me, um, for about 20 meters. And overall, when you consider males and females, out of the seven pairs that I looked at, about 30% of their roots were reused or overlapping. Um, I also looked to see if they were making significant directional changes. So here is an output for something called the change point test, which is just used working backwards from a root to figure out at what point um, they're essentially making acute angles. They're changing direction um, in a way that seems intentional or directed, if you will. Um, and then I also looked at how circuitous their roots are. So if we have a root with multiple segments, how you know, out of the way are they going relative to the straight line distance? And so what we find is that as the roots get longer, individuals are becoming more circuitous. So they're taking a less direct route to get to the goal location. I always like to say when I, when I talk about this bit is that, you know, not every environment is going to be conducive to direct travel. And so um, it's this in tandem with these other pieces of the puzzle that kind of feed into the idea that slow lorises share and display similar characteristics as root-based cognitive map users um, when we're considering primates. And this here is just an image of, of an actual root that a male took um, relative to a simulated root. So we also do this to account for the fact that we don't know the sensory range of an individual, like how far they can see specifically or how far they can smell something specifically. And so we use these simulated roots to compare how good is the simulation relative to the actual root. And when we have a lower buffer around, um, soloruses get to resources more efficiently. When there's um, an intermediary or intermediate buffer, um, the simulation in the solaris are about comparable. And when there's a larger buffer, something that you might not be able to know is there, um, or something you could identify from a visual cue, the simulations outperform the soloruses. So with all of these things in consideration, um, soloruses are actually really interesting in terms of how they perceive their environment. Um, and so, you know, 
they're a bit more complex than I think some people give them credit. The next aspect was in conservation. So I actually started my interest in primate movement in conservation because I was doing post-release monitoring of some released pygmy sole orses in Vietnam. Um, and the gist of that project is that reintroductions are really, really difficult. Um, hardly any of the lorises is settled in the, in the reintroduction site. They covered twice as much area as we'd anticipated. Um, they just did all of these things that we didn't really expect. And so it kind of made me reflect on what we were doing and what the process is that goes into slow lorise reintroductions, which can be somewhat difficult in terms of their success rates. Um, and I think the short of it is that slow lorises have a much more complex relationship with their environment. And it's something we need to you know, dig more into, better understand the way that structure and content um, is framing their movement patterns, which is something I saw in the job in slow lorises. And so we need to take more um, data from the natural bounds of a certain species and try to apply it and recreate a similar context or scenarios when we're doing reintroductions. Um, and so I just think there is a lot more to learn and that there's a lot more that we can apply um, to these conservation efforts. And so I think the main thing that really struck me about my time um, during my PhD was the way that they mentally represented their environment, how they moved in this sort of directed way um, and obviously it wasn't random movement, um, but our limitation in not knowing what their sensory capacity was more or less. And that led me to email Dr. Eva Garrett, who thankfully responded to my emails and was very open to the idea of me joining um, the sensory morphology and genomic anthropology lab at Boston University. And so, you know, if you see someone interesting or doing work that's really interesting to you, I'd say go ahead and email them because you never know what will happen. But it worked out in this instance. And while I was there, one of the kind of overarching questions I'd say was, um, how does sensory morphology help primates understand their environment? Now, this is a really big question and we did not crack this code while we were there. Um, but I did get the opportunity to learn a lot about primate olfaction. And so I'd say while working with Dr. Garrett, um, I gained a better understanding of how integral olfaction is to habitat use, to sociality. Um, and here is just a little image that I looked at one of her papers in that we're dividing the olfactory system in primates into two parts. We have the main olfactory system and the verbal nasal system. While there is some overlap in function between the two, um, we largely associate the main olfactory system with um, environmental cues. Um, whereas the vomo nasal system is largely associated with uh, things like pheromones, and so it's kind of more linked to social interactions. Um, so in addition to thinking about the variation in, specifically we were looking um, at things like the olfactory receptor genes or the vomo nasal receptor genes, as well as the sizes of olfactory bulb, um, that region of the brain, and the accessory olfactory bulb size, um, we became really interested in thinking about how the geometry of the nasal cavity is going to influence the way that particles in our environment are going to be absorbed and ultimately um, interpreted by those gene receptors. And so that led us to um, write a little digest um, where we're considering particle deposition as well as sensory drive. And so I made this little figure, if you will, in Canva, maybe it was. So this is a mythical place in which all of these primates live in a similar environment. Um, and the idea behind it is that we know that there is a level of mutualism between the particles being emitted by, you know, the different vegetation, different fruits, different things within the environment. So there are all of these particles that are around us that are coming off of our body, that are coming off of trees, that are coming off of the other animals. Um, and that environment is still trying to communicate a signal to a particular species. Um, and through sensory drive, the idea is that um, there should be some sort of, the relationship between the signal and the recipient of the signal should be maximized more or less. That there is a level of diversification that can happen from living in different environments. And so this is something while we, again, 
weren't able to get empirical data for or um, really dive into the sensory drive hypothesis um, in primates, it's still a question that's really, you know, on my mind and something that um, the lab is working to somehow test now through airflow and particle deposition simulations. Um, I say fortunately, well, unfortunately, because I, got, I had to leave uh, Dr. Garrett's lab, which was a really lovely time, but very fortunately for me, I got the call in 2019 to go and test out this theory here. Um, so I got offered a position at the university at Buffalo. And while COVID-19 has, has like kind of minimized my ability to, to really watch and measure how quickly people walk, I can definitely feel the urgency that they were trying to convey in this comment. So if you have not seen Piled High and Deeper Comics, I highly recommend it. Whether you're a first year grad student um, or a senior professor, there's something for everybody. And so I joined the anthropology department as an assistant professor, as well as being affiliated with the evolution, ecology, and behavior program. And so again, COVID-19 has made my first year very interesting. Um, I'm very happy because I've got a lot of great students that work in the lab and a lot of, I gained a lot of new, really great colleagues. And so right now, I'd say that the Poindexter Lab, I'm still working on a somewhat pithy, cool lab name that kind of covers all of my interests, which are very diverse. Um, but for the time being, we are the Poindexter Lab, and we have field interests, captive interests, and computational interests. Um, and so we're looking to apply camera traps to survey Sulawesi populations in northern Vietnam. We're also working at a, a wild population in Thailand to collect movement patterns and behavioral observations on a new population. In captivity, um, we're working to figure out ways to um, measure the variation in various gene receptors like SR1 with Dr. Alicia Rich. And we're also interested in contextualizing olfactory behavior. Um, is there a higher frequency of sniffing behaviors in social contexts or in ecological or feeding contexts in captivity? Um, and we're also looking at ways to characterize fat deposition patterns in slow lorises, um, which are really interesting primate in that, um, you know, they live at all of these different altitudes um, and they have coat changes, their body changes. And so just characterizing how they're depositing that fat and, and when it starts to happen is something that I'm really interested in. And we also have some computational work, which has been, you know, a savior in, in the times of Zoom and remote work. Um, and so we're continuing the project that looks at nasal cavity geometry. Um, and we're hoping to, you know, kick off more with the particle deposition and airflow simulations once we can do some more nasal cavity reconstructions. But all in all, I'd say that my broad research goals and interests are to study how an organism, primarily nocturnal primates, um, interact with conspecifics, with mates, um, other individuals within the area, um, how they interact with other organisms, including humans. Um, so prey, predators, us, uh, unfortunately. And how they are using information from the environment to inform some of these behaviors and decisions that they might be making. Um, and then what sort of behaviors or morphologies evolved to facilitate all of these interactions. Um, and with that, I'm at 22 minutes. Um, I want to thank my PhD advisor, of course, um, Dr. Anna Karras and Dr. Vincent Nyman, as well as my postdoc advisor, Dr. Eva Garrett, um, all of the people who work at the Little Fireface Project, the Endangered Primate Rescue Center, and of course, Black in Biological Anthropology for the invitation to speak, and all the LFP funders. These are not my personal funders, I wish, um, but by funding LFP, they have you know, in the end really helped me out in terms of data collection and answering questions that I'm interested in. And so I think that is all I have in terms of slides. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Conductor. That was so great. We actually have a bunch of questions I'm coming sorry, in. Hear you. Sorry, I think I was muted. Um, uh, thank <laughs> Thank you. That was so great. We actually have a bunch of questions coming in, so I guess I'll start with the earliest. 
Um, sure. So this question relates a little bit to your earlier career. Um, and the question is, did you ever feel like you were steered away from what you wanted to pursue? Um, I personally can't say that I have been, but I also think that I went into a lot of the things that I did not really knowing what I was doing. So I was just kind of like driving forward and be like, I'm going to show up. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to do this. Um, and I think I was really fortunate to find people along the way that were like, all right, come come on to the lab or, yep, you want to study lorises, go for it. Um, but there was no one in particular, even my parents, imagine telling them that it's like, I'm not going to be a doctor, which is really familiar to them. Um, instead, I want to be a primate doctor, but not a vet, not that sort of primate doctor. Um, and they're like, oh, yeah, sure. And so I think I was very fortunate in that no one was just like, well, how are you going to pay rent? But um, those are questions for later. That's awesome. And I'm sure that's a an experience that really helped you out and made navigating your path a little bit easier. Oh. So we have some questions related to field work. Sure. Um, so the first question is, can you tell us a little bit more about how the radio tracking actually works? Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, each loris is outfitted with, so these aren't GPS collars. LFP has been running since 2011. And so at the time, and it's only really about now that we can have GPS collars that are small enough and light enough um, to be suitable for slow lorises because they're so small. Um, so these are just VHF collars and um, they are outfitted on each individual and given a unique frequency for each slow lores. Each lores is also microchip, so um, they can they have pretty distinct faces, but you can also confirm who that individual is based on the uh, microchip. But using these unique frequencies, you can find the individual you're looking for. Um, but also because they have pretty stable home ranges, you know, if you're looking for a particular individual, you know whereabouts they'll be, and then you can use the um, antenna and receiver to, you know, zero in on that frequency and try to try and relate where they are and get a visual on the individual. But now I'd like to move into GPS colors, just for the record. They are very cool. Um, it would be very helpful. Yeah, I actually did a little bit of, of research using GPS colors too, and they're excellent, especially when you can't find the primates. Yes. I'm very excited. But it is like a bit of thing that I don't know. At one point, I, I got some that were designed for birds. So I was like, you know, it's an agro forest. It'll reach the satellite, so it'll be fine. And it did not work very well. Um, but now there are actual GPS collars that could be suitable for um, an animal of that size. And so I'm really excited to see what sorts of horizons um, we can. I don't know what the phrasing is, but it'll be really cool. Thank you for that. So our next question is, uh, can you basically just walk us through a day in the life in the field? What does it look like to be an anthropologist, biological anthropologist, start to end? Sure. I'm gonna say first off, it really depends on where you are because the day in Vietnam was a lot of climbing around on limestone or, okay, so we get up, we take, I might take a little nap. I'm not very great at sleeping during the daytime. Um, but if we're starting out around six, I might take a little nap between four and six. Um, and then we go off to um, where we think the individual is sleeping. Um, and then we try to follow them um, until midnight based on the GPS signal. And hopefully we have a visual observation of them. Um, but while I was in Vietnam, it was very hard to get visual observation on these individuals. Um, and it was a lot of climbing and you'd see the lores kind of cross along the trees above you. But um, since we can't move as seamlessly as they could, it was us like lagging behind them as we try to climb through these rocks. Um, whereas at LFP, there's a bit more visibility um, because it's Niagara forest. Uh, it's not as dense as, as the forest was in Vietnam. And so, uh, once you've found the individual, you can more or less stay with them for the duration. There are periods of out of sight, which is just gonna happen with something that size, especially at night. Um, but we tend to just follow along with them 
Sometimes they spend a while in one tree and they move to the next tree, or sometimes they're just moving the whole time. Um, and so it really just depends on the loris in the night. But once you get back, if you can sleep, go to sleep and you know wake up when you can. But there's also a number of things that are happening during the daytime, like vegetation plots. Um, and LFP has a really big um, education program. And so there would be different teams of people doing different things. And so we tried to schedule it where you didn't have a lot during the day and also a long night shift. But um, it definitely takes a special type of person, I'd say, to want to stay up all night. But I highly recommend it. It's great. Oh, that sounds like a jam-packed schedule. Oof, that's a marathon. Yeah. Day. <laughs> yeah, it's fun though, it's thrilling. All right, so our next question has to do with the reintroductions. And so does reintroducing orphans make the transfers easier? Um, that's interesting. I, so all of the individuals that were reintroduced um, at that site were reintroduced in pairs. Um, and as far as I knew, they were all adults, though there is work that suggests that sub adults will do better when they, um, when you want to reintroduce individuals, but we, we didn't reduce, reduce, reintroduce, excuse me, any individuals. So I can't say they didn't always stay together, but we, we tried to pair them up when they were re reintroduced. Interesting, interesting thing to consider in the future. All right, so our next question is, if you don't have a background in anthropology but are interested in uh, being more involved in the field, are there any opportunities to delve into it more and what would we be the advice to do that? Um, I think absolutely. Uh, I'm a big, I always say, if you find people that are interesting, email them because the worst thing that's gonna happen is that you don't get a response. And so I, I really don't think anyone should have any hesitation about emailing someone a question or emailing them about opportunities um, because, you know, people might respond. And I find, especially in my experience, most people have responded. If they didn't have anything themselves, they knew of something or someone or a place where they were looking for individuals. And I think um, sometimes people have hesitations if they don't have field experience beforehand to reach out, but everyone has to start somewhere. Right. There's always you just have to find the right people who are willing to take a chance on you or um, maybe a field school if you just want to kind of get your feet wet. But I definitely think you should always reach out if you see a project that looks interesting. Go for it. You never know what will happen. I think that's great advice. An email is a pretty low risk endeavor. Low. Yeah. Really good payoff. Exactly. If you don't send that email, it's the same as if you had and didn't get a response. And so I think exactly. it makes sense to send that email. Exactly. All right. The questions are pouring in now. So the next one is, uh, was it difficult to decide what the topic of your graduate research was going to be? Um, not, no, not necessarily. Because when I came to Brooks, I was already interested in like captive welfare. For me, I thought that um, studying captive welfare would be something that was always going to be a pressing topic and a pressing question because, you know, um, I feel like zoos are, are here to stay and it's just a matter of what we can do to make them um, the best environments for, for, you know, different species. But once I got to Brooks and I met Anna, I was just like, wow, this primary is really weird. It's really interesting and it needs more attention. And so for me, it was a really easy pivot to, to be like, well, they also should have considerations and someone should be focused on trying to figure out what um, welfare concerns there will be and how to mitigate them. And so it was really easy for me to be like, okay, well, slow lorises, they, like, they look striking, they need help. And that's something I was interested in doing. Um, so it was pretty straightforward for me nice when things come together like that. Yeah, I think it helps too that there's kind of a lot of space in, in slow loris work. There are, there are many questions that still need answering. Um, and so there's like a, a whole list of things that you can pull from and still be really helpful forwards towards the species. Mm -hmm. So a related question is how often did you change your research interests? And at what point in your 
uh, journey were you encouraged to sort of streamline that process and pick the direction? Um, I'd say after I decided that I was going to study primates, I probably changed my interests what that's gonna that sounds ridiculously low in changes but i think i think it was it was probably once maybe twice because initially i wanted to study grade eight um behavior in, in captive welfare and then i swapped over to the other end and it's the lorises but i really kind of stayed on that captive welfare enrichment um path throughout my master's and I think it was something that struck me while I was watching them at the rescue center and something that my advisor said about cognitive maps. And I was like, wait a second, because I remember seeing the slow lorises do something sort of interesting where I felt like they were planning paths in their enclosures. And so as soon as she said that, it all kind of fell into place and all of the other bits sort of fell around it. Um, so the more I talk about it, it's like I've been very fortunate and like things have fallen into place, but uh, I'm not very big on like weight waffling if that makes any sense like once i decide that this is where we're going that's essentially where i go great and so you mentioned um wanting to do some great ape studies earlier on did you ever get a chance to pursue that path or and or um are you looking to pursue that path sometime in the future um well sort of i'd say because my interests in that stemmed from um, some work I did at the St. Louis Zoo, which was studying um, the chimpanzees that they had there. And so I was taking data collection. And it was a part of a course that I was taking um, as an undergraduate. And so that's where my interest in it sort of started. And so I guess I did kind of get a chance to do some of that work. Um, and I'm definitely still interested. I like nocturnal primates really interest me and really captivate me because they're just so um, I don't know, they're just so unusual and kind of striking. Um, but I am also very interested in comparative work. I'm really interested in um, like broad captive welfare. And so um, I'm definitely not running away from any opportunities that involve great apes. Um, so yeah, I, I would for sure if the opportunity presented itself. So speaking of having such a broad range of interests, uh, one of the questions that we just got was, do you ever feel that, you know, switching from between uh, conservation to behavior to morphology, that you had to catch up in a different subfield or research area? And um, if so, do you have any advice on um, how to sort of manage having a research interest that spans different subfields? Sure, yeah, and uh, absolutely. I feel like most of the time I have no idea what I'm doing or talking about um, in like an authoritative sense. And so I'm always reading and, and trying to catch up on what's happened um, in certain topics. But I think one thing to consider is that all of these different topics really work well together. Like they're really playing off of each other to um, facilitate, you know, interactions or survival within the wild for different species. And so it's, I don't really see them as being a hard distinction between you know, behavior and morphology. It's like the behaviors might be a result of some aspect of your morphology, right? Or um, the thing that's making you vulnerable in terms of conservation could be a result of some behavioral thing or physiological thing or some aspect of your life history, but also knowing these different aspects can help improve conservation efforts. And so I think a lot of it is really overlapping, to be honest with you. Um, but I think we're always going to be catching up. There's always something new. Even if I only studied, you know, slow Loris's left leg, there's always going to be something new, some other paper that I can use to like contextualize something that I saw. And so I think we're always catching up. I just get used to it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, things change so fast. Yeah. <laughs> um, so continuing on in our little advice corner, having recently successfully navigated into the job market, do you have any recommendations for current postdocs or recent graduates? Um, I would say to be very open about um, 
about career opportunities. I think it's it's difficult to have a lot of strict, a lot of restrictions on where you uh, would consider working, um, whether it's a geographic restriction or a department restriction or um, I don't know whether or not you are really set on being a professor, but there might be something else that can really tap into all the things that you really like to do and you're really interested in doing um, that might not be under the label you are used to. And so I think, yeah, I think be, just being really open and planning ahead. I'm always for planning ahead. Uh, also use your network, I'd say that for sure. Um, that's one of the big things, but like being at Brooks was really great, but one of the really big things that comes out of that is this massive network of people who, who study primates in all different sorts of contexts and in all sorts of places. Um, and so if you need someone to read your material for this field that you might not be familiar with, um, you know, see if someone knows someone that's in that field who can review you, your material for you or, um, but just tap into the people that you know to try and, you know, enhance your, your documents and also like work with each other, have a nice little unit that can, can help you review things or do practice interviews. Um, so it's nice to have a pod to do that sort of preparation. Really great advice. All right. So um, the next question is given the theme of our Black and BioEnth week, what can we do to support students of color who are interested in biological anthropology? And do you think there are any disciplinary changes that we need to address? Um, I probably have a list of things. Uh, <laughs> I think things like this week are really helpful because we're increasing visibility. I swear over the summer, I've seen so many like black in like different subfields and I just had no idea. I didn't, had no idea there were so many black people studying at behavior, so many primatologists. Um, and so like you spend a lot of time being the only African-American or the only black person in your cohort or in the field site or in this, you know, wherever you are. Um, so it's really nice to connect and know that there is, that there are other people. Um, I think that's really reassuring. I also think this is probably like a greater question that go like a greater concern that goes beyond just um, helping with like racial diversity within the field. But I think anthropology, especially primatology or any sort of field based um, subfield within anthropology is really focused in getting field work experience. Um, and that can be really expensive. And that's just creating a boundary or a barrier that um, if we don't have the financial support to overcome, it's just such an easy thing to weed people out. Like if that is a, a bare minimum requirement to get an internship somewhere, then you're already going to, you know, exclude a number of people who don't have that sort of financial means to go and, you know, pay all this money to be in another place. And so I think there needs to be something done about that. And I know there are a lot of people who are, are concerned with this as well and talking about ways to overcome this sort of been in the field requirement because you really do kind of create this pay to play scenario, which I don't, I don't think anyone um, is intending to do, but it's where we are. No, I totally agree with that. that that's actually one of the things that we were discussing in the Black and BioEnth group early on was all of these sort of uh, unintentional barriers that get put up that sort of weed out students of color. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're gonna turn a little bit uh, back to your field work. And so this is a straightforward question. How many countries have you done research in? Um, not that many. Let's see. So, okay, Vietnam. Indonesia, Thailand. I guess I'll count the UK. We've done some stuff in the UK and the US. I think that's it. Mm. Yeah, I'd say that's it. Maybe a random place in Europe, but I think that's five. <laughs> that is still really impressive. And how was it uh, working in the field at night, especially? Was it scary? What was that like? Um, it's it wasn't scary for me. Um, when you like 
build a team that's going to go out at night. You need these, you have to really trust the people that are with you. Um, and all of the trackers and all of the other researchers that I've, that I've worked with in the field have been really, really great people. And so I've always felt really comfortable around them. Um, as well as, you know, having knowledgeable people to help me avoid things that might kill me. So, <laughs> um, I don't know. I've never found it to be terribly scary. I also joke around in that I can only really see about 10 meters in front of me. And so if there is something really scary off in the distance, um, I don't know. And so like ignorance and splits in that respect. Um, but I think it's just about being prepared and knowing what you might encounter. And so as a planner type person, I've always been pretty secure and comfortable going out at night. I've gotten into some hairy like rock climbing in the limestone situations. Like once we were on a boulder that was not quite secure and the tracker, one of the trackers was at the end and it started to tilt forward and I had to pull his, <laughs> pull him back by the, the back of his jacket. Um, but other than that, everything's been pretty fine. Nice, nice. Um, so how much do you have to think about the other organisms, flora and fauna, that coexist around slow lorises in their environment? How do the web of relationships between species influence your research ideas? Um, I think all of that is really critical. Like, I think there are a, a host of things that have led to this suite of, of behaviors and morphologies that lorises exhibit now. And all of that is in response to their environment, um, like in response to them kind of having this tango or back and forth or avoiding this prey or trying to be more efficient at catching, avoiding that predator and being more efficient at catching a certain prey. Um, so I like to consider it more, I'm thinking about it much more now when I think about um, field projects, but I think it's one of these things that everyone should really be considering. Like nothing happens in isolation. Every, all of the behaviors are like you're recording on that single individual is in response to or informed by something in their environment. And so I think all of them really work together. And so it's not, they shouldn't be separated, I think, as best you can. I know, I know we can't collect data on absolutely everything, but um, it, we, it's really hard to think about certain, um, certain research in isolation. Yeah. For sure. Um, so did the findings of your research uh, affect the strategies in releasing slow lorises? Um, not yet, no. I'd say <laughs> I started with the releasing, with the, the reintroduction, but you know what? Actually, that is not true, that's not true. Um, because we did write, that was one of the first things that we wrote up from the project. And I know at the site where they do, where I was doing this reintroduction, that they use this material, um, and they're a bit more careful, and in the way that they are looking at the environment and in trying to determine what an ideal release site is. Um, but I haven't been directly involved in any reintroductions there again. But I'm definitely looking forward to going back there, and you know, we'll see. Solar's reintroduction is such, it's such an interesting thing. It's so tricky. And sometimes it's sad because you're just, who knows what's going to happen. But um, hopefully, I mean, I hope I hope some of our work is 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 being helpful. I can't say directly, but I like to think it is. <laughs> um, are the loris given individual names? If so, how do you decide what to name name them, and how do you feel about it? Um, actually. Depending on where you are, they will get names. The lorises in Indonesia all have individual names. Um, sometimes donors pick the names, but within those family units, the, the mother's name, say it starts with a T, and they do their best to keep all of their offspring with the T. So, you know, someone's there one year, five years later, they show up and they can trace back that lineage based on the names. Um, when I was in Thailand, I named a few of the lorises because they were coming into the rescue center very regularly. Um, and sometimes I just gave them various Thai names that I found. Um, and I don't know, I don't, I don't have a problem with them being named. I don't think it necessarily clouds the way that I perceive them. Um, especially because I, I didn't name them based on any sort of you know, characteristic or behavioral 
um, aspect that that I observe. And so, I mean, having a name could be the same as just having a number. Though I know some people have very intense feelings about either or. I think it's okay to name them. Do you have a favorite name? I do have a favorite name for the Lorises and for the one of the Thai Loris I named Bao, which uh, <laughs> he was one of my favorite Lorises. Um, and then there's a Loris in Indonesia named Luchu, which is cute in Indonesian, and she was my favorite one. <laughs> they were favorites before they were named, so or they were favorites after they were named, so I didn't I didn't pick the good names for them. They ended up being really good names. Yeah, they ended. <laughs> All right. So the next question is: While these lorises were being microchipped, um, is there any uh, is there ever DNA samples that are taken to potentially study connections between stress and hormone levels and social relationships or interactions with the environments? Um, not at any of the field sites that I've worked at. Um, last I checked, well. I haven't checked in a while, while, but there was someone working on a captive population to try to validate some um, some assays with stress hormones, but um, no, not I haven't participated in any, um, but I think things are brewing in, in that respect. There's still there's a lot there's still a lot of space and lots of things to learn with regards to solars, so there's definitely someone on that. It is not me though. Cool, really cool. Um, so our next question is, how does your work with the Little, little Fireface Project help protect and conserve slow lorises against threats like the illegal pet trade? Well, the Little Fireface Project is doing a lot um, to help raise awareness. And so, I mean, if you think about the things that are driving the illegal wildlife trade is demand and like desire to have these animals as pets or um, or whatever whatever you would want a loris for. And so I think building awareness, which is something that they're very good at, um, helps to that person who's considering having a loris as a pet might come across some of this the awareness materials or some of the the videos. Um, and has been on a number of, of television shows highlighting the slow lorises. Um, they might reconsider it, knowing, you know, that they're venomous, that they don't do well in captivity, that they're nocturnal, that they're critically endangered. And so knowing that alone is already going to help deter individuals from um, wanting them. And then you can also hope that you inform a few people and then they kind of act like micro influencers and spread that awareness further and further and further. So when they come across one of these videos on YouTube, uh, they might comment or they might say, hey, this is actually a critically endangered primate. You shouldn't be tickling it or um, you shouldn't dress it up. Or maybe if you go on holiday, because one of the things with the is uh, they're popular as a photo prop. So maybe you have an informed friend with someone who isn't familiar with the plight of the slowers. They go somewhere where they have the opportunity to take a picture of a slow loris as a prop, you know, and they can not engage. And so slowly the demand to have photos with them or the demand to have them as pets starts to de decrease. Um, and then you can feel those, uh, you can feel the benefits of that in the population increase. That's the hope. But this is the sort of thing that takes time, right? Um, and you don't necessarily see the results of it very quickly. but you I think awareness is one of the really big ways that they're contributing towards solar loris conservation. Yeah, for sure. So where did the Little Fireface Project name come from? It's actually, so the Sundanese name for slow loris is Little Fireface or Munka Jenny. Oh man, I can't believe I remember that. Pulled it off the top of my head. Um, but it's essentially the word for slow loris in, in, in Sundanese. Cool. Um, so in slow loris uh, rehabilitation, is it hard to pre uh, prevent humanization and habituation? And what do you do to prevent it? Um, in terms of reintroductions, the short, the least amount of time, the less time they spend in captivity, the better chance of them um, settling. And so um, you really do 
want to minimize the time that they're spent in captivity. And so then you're gonna minimize this risk of humanization, if you will. Um, again, that isn't always possible. And like everyone is definitely doing what they can to the best of their abilities. Um, but yeah, that's one way to try to minimize that that issue, which can definitely be a problem, but you wanna turn them over relatively quickly, if you will. And related to that, um, have you observed any instances of human wildlife contact or conflict uh, between the lorises and um, some of the uh, local populations? Um, contact, well, at the LFP field site, it's a montane agroforest. And so the lorises are, you know, sleeping in bamboo that's next to a agricultural plot that's growing a gourd or carrots or cabbage. Um, and so you can find lorises passing through places that are, um, that have a high human population or like they're just adjacent to the village. And so you'll be out observing them and you can still hear the moss calling or you can see the lights from the city. And so they aren't, it's not terribly remote in the sense that there are no people around. Um, I, while I have been there, well, actually, well, no, I, I'd say I haven't witnessed any direct conflict, but we do know it happens. Um, we've had individuals that are brought into, brought to the house, um, or like you can try to reintroduce individuals and, and um, that might not go as well. There's also like the risks of dogs and sometimes um, there will be cases where uh, maybe some kids will get a hold of the slow lures, but while I have been at all of the sites, nothing big has happened like that. But in keeping up with what's going on at LFP, um, which they're really transparent about, um, you can see some of these conflicts that persist. Um, but I also think too that the people really appreciate slow lures in that environment especially knowing that they're like eating the insects that are around their, um, their crops. Um, and like realizing the mutualism that, that they can really have between each other. Um, so yeah, there's always the risk for sure, but I think they're doing a pretty good job of sort of mediating those risks. That's good, that's ex exciting news. Um, so how does the capture of slow lorises go? Is it by darting, is it by trapping? Um, given your work on slow loris welfare, do you have thoughts on um, how to make primate capture safer? Sure. Um, so there it is not by um, trapping or by darting. It's uh, one of the trackers who are very great at climbing trees. Like we more or less find a place in which slower, the loris cannot, there's not a lot of connectivity and so they aren't like, trying to run away. Um, and so a tracker will go up to the tree, capture them um, by hand, they're wearing gloves. Um, and then we try to keep them out of that tree for as little time as possible. So you get them, keep a small team so it's not like uh, you're observing an operation with 10 people around you. Um, again, we're using the red filtered lights, taking the measurements and the weights, checking the collar and releasing them back. And so it is something that's definitely um, on everyone's mind. And so I think there's a lot of care taken in, in trying to capture these lorises. Um, I actually don't have any experience darting individuals or using traps, um, but I think that there's definitely um, a balance in which we know you need to capture them for various reasons, um, but if you try to minimize how much time they're spent um, not in their natural environment or not where, they, where you found them, that's the best way to go about it and to minimize how many people or how much noise um, or like how many manipulations, I suppose, or what you're doing while you have them. Um, but I know that every question isn't conducive to, to the methods that they're using at LFP or what we were using in Vietnam. So it varies, depends, but I think, yeah, as long as everyone is considering all of these things and tries to pick the best, the, le the least invasive option, then that's all you can really ask for. Yeah, exactly. So I have two related questions. The first of which is, can you describe working with local communities at your field sites? 
what suggestions do you have as far as education and conservation go with engaging local populations? And related to that, are there any language barriers between you and uh, local researchers, trackers, other people that you regularly engage with? And did you sure. need to learn with the local languages? Well, it would have been very helpful and it's ideal to um, learn a local language for sure. Um, fortunately, Indonesian is like not tonal. And so I'd always have my little book with me and the site has been running for so long that um, many of the trackers have picked up a lot of English, but it's always fun to like, cause I'm also trying to pick up some Indonesian too while I'm there and like be more agile in the way that we communicate. And so I'm trying to say things in Indonesian, they're trying to say things in English. And so we kind of have a back and forth. And even while I was in Vietnam, which is a total language, that one was very tricky, but I can just remember me sitting there as there's this Loris up here and I'm just saying the same word over and over and over again. And the tracker's just like, no, that's not right. No, that's not right. Or he asks, he points to a word in the book and I say it in English and he says it in, in Vietnamese. And I've never fully picked up any of the languages for the places in which I've worked. Um, I am definitely trying to do better but um, it's tricky. It can be tricky, it can be tricky. Um, but as long as you know there is some means of communication, you can still get the work done for sure. In terms of working with the local community, I think that's really important. And I think a lot of the successes for the Little Fireface Project has been because they are really um, inclusive with uh, the people that you know, are living with the Lorises essentially um, and asking what they need and, and how can our presence there or their presence there um, be kind of a beneficial experience for everyone. And so one thing that, that really comes to mind is that um, to connect some of the fragments, they use um, these artificial um, canopy bridges more or less. Um, and a lot of them are made out of water pipes. And because it's an agricultural area, you know, having a water line run up to, um, to your plot is really beneficial. And so we're like matching these two things where the, you're meeting the needs of the loris, you're also meeting the needs of the people um, that, that are living right around the area that you work. So I think it's really important for sure to, um, to not try to just be, to plop there, do what you're gonna do and then leave, but if you want to keep something going long term, you know, you want to really help conserve these populations, it's going to take dialogue going both ways. Um, so, yeah, very important and something that everyone should really consider, depending on what I suppose it depends on what what the goal is, really. But communication is always key. Definitely, definitely. Um, and so, related to your field work, what was the largest obstacle that you had to face, whether it's uh, working in a different climate or a different environment, a different lifestyle, physical hazards or challenges, things like that? Um, I think the biggest barrier is always going to be the fact that for what I want to do, excuse me, or like the questions I want to answer, I need to travel somewhere to get there. And I think I wouldn't have considered that a barrier prior to 2020, but it really is a limit. It's, it's really a restriction. And I'm, it's not the case for everyone. And it, it's okay if, if, you know, there are some challenges when you go to different places, but I feel like I'm always looking to experience something new or, um, I kind of, I'm like drawn towards a bit of an adventure. And so I've never found it particularly difficult in the places I've been in. And also by fieldwork standards, I've been in pretty relatively nice places, to be honest with you. Like there was steady internet. Um, there wasn't running water at one place, but there was like hot water tank at, at another place. And so I haven't really truly roughed it in the way that a lot of people do. Um, and there's always been someone around like other researchers around or um, like a field manager around. And so I've never really felt like isolated. Um, and I don't know, it kind of feels, to me, it like feels like going on a field, like a, a camp. You're going to camp and there's lorises and it's really exciting. Um, and so I've, I haven't had any trouble adjusting to different cultures or to different 
places per se. Um, but I do think more and more about my limitation to get to where I want to be like right now or last summer or this coming summer. Like there are so many things I'd like to do or I'd, I'd want to go and, and see lorises, but I can't because I can't travel. And this would not be the case if I was within that country or if I studied um, something that lived here, you know what I mean? And so the more I think about it, the fact that I have to fly to another continent to, you know, to collect my data is somewhat of a, a limitation. Yeah. And it really, right now, I guess you're feeling the, the weight of that even more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, and so the final two questions we have are sort of getting back to this idea of how we can support Black students, Black biological anthropologists at all levels from different sides. So the first question is, if you could persuade university administrators, presidents, provosts, deans, et cetera, to make one big structural institutional change to help Black academics succeed, what would that be? Hmm. Can I do two? Does it have to be just one? <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, everything you have. Right, right, right. Um, I think that it isn't just enough to, I know there's a really big push to um, increase uh, the diversity of the staff or the faculty um, and like the immediate answer is just to hire more diverse applicants. Um, but I think that the issue doesn't necessarily lie in just that there aren't enough diverse faces or diverse individuals within the university, but the barriers that made, made the environment as it is. I, I don't think, I think that we aren't really fixing the issues that have created this um, I don't want to say monoculture, but has created the lack of diversity that we see now. And so I think it's really important that we chip away at what what was making this environment not conducive to to hire. Because there's there's no shortage of of qualified diverse applicants. There is no shortage of people who should be in these positions or could successfully do the jobs that people are being hired to do. Um, but we need to like backtrack more. And so I think a big thing would probably be supporting um, supporting more individuals early along in the pipeline, if that makes sense. Um, because there, there's something along the way that is resulting in the lack of diversity that we see now. Um, and I always, you know, financial support. Like we can make all the programs, but if there is no money to support the programs, um, they're just gonna flop after that short window that they were allowed to run. And so there needs to be like a continued financial support um, that will, you know, it's not, I don't think it's gonna be a quick fix, but it might help to create a more diverse environment than, we, than what we see now. So money, <laughs> financial support and more money. Always the answer. <laughs> So we got one uh, last minute question in. And so what impact has the pandemic had on field staff and data collection, everything that's going on at your various field sites? Well, I'll say mainly for me, since I was starting a new position, I was excited to be like an independent PI. And yes, I, I'm still an independent PI, even if I um, haven't been able to go to the field, but it has slowed down some um, reconnaissance work and like building towards having a data set that um, I'm more or less in control of, right? So while you're a graduate student, while you're a postdoc, um, you're really working with materials um, that more or less belong to someone else. And so as you start your own lab, um, it's exciting to start to build your own data set. And so all of that has more or less been put on hold um, so that was a bit of a bummer, but, you know, I'm also a very pro stay in your house for COVID-19. So it's unfortunate, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, so hopefully as, you know, the vaccine comes and things, you know, start to be better, um, I'll be really excited to get out to some of the sites and collect the data that I've been talking about getting for now a year and a half.
So here's to hoping we can travel again at some point. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so I guess as our final question to wrap things up, yeah. speaking to future generations of Black biological anthropologists, what would be your takeaways, um, your sort of main statement and advice to give to them um, on how to enter the field and stay in the field and, and you know, all that? Um, I would say, first off, that you are not alone. It might seem like you are. Maybe you're the only one in your program or you just haven't seen any other black uh, biological anthropologists, but we are out here. Um, and so, you know, just look for a network or look for some peers that, that can, help, um, can help you along the way. And I also think that you have to have like a level of tenacity in which you're like, this is what's gonna, like, we're gonna do this. And um, regardless of if you do have to be the only person in the room, you are going to keep going forward as far as you can. Some things will be out of your hands for sure, um, but you have to have sort of a resolve that this, this is the direction you wanna head in. You're allowed to change paths as well. I'm not saying that you have to, you have to have it all figured out at the beginning, which is not the case. Um, but I do think that if, if you wanna stay in academia, it has to be one of these things where you can't imagine doing something else, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it can be treacherous out there. But yeah, keep yeah. at it. <laughs> Tenacity is yeah. a great trait to have in this field. Yes, it is for sure. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Poindexter. This was really, really, really great. And we appreciate you taking the time to tell us a little bit about your journey and your research and imparting all of your knowledge and advice on to us. Um, it's really great. Um, so for everyone who attended, thank you for attending. Be sure to follow the Black and Bioanth group on Twitter and Instagram at Black and Bioanth um, to learn more about the different events that are going to be taking place this week and to register for them and to engage with us more on social media. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good Thanks evening.